All right, I think I'm live. Yes, excellent. All right. Oh, wow, Ashford's on already. All right, it's wonderful to see you, Ashford, my friend. Let's see. What a great day to continue working on percussion and other sweetening. Yes, yes, it is. Or start spatial effects. Yes, exactly. Yep, that's exactly what we're doing today. So last week, I introduced my process for percussion. All right, and I talked about how I'm trying to speed things up a little bit. Let's pull up my notes from last time. Oh, no, that was project setup. Why'd I pull that up? Project notepad. There it is. Um, things to keep in mind for timpani. Yep. So macro level considerations. Where are we? Where are we? But I talked about how I have specific roles that I try to keep in mind. I really should have focused on. Uh, anywho, it looks like I don't have the notes here anymore. Anyways. Uh, yeah, so we talked about how there are seven traditional roles of the percussion section. There is doubling for color, ostinati, extreme dynamics, solo statements, harmonic support, builds and climaxes, and highlighting accents. There we go. So we got all seven memorized. All right. And so when I go through music, I'll go through each of those sections. Each. All right. I'll make sure that I have everything I'll find out, I'll go through each section, I'll see, is there any place for here for have an ostinato? I'll see, is there anywhere where I can have a kind of a build or a climax on the cymbal or the bass drum? Yada, yada, yada. I'll go through all seven steps. And in the last video, we did get some examples of that. Mostly, I think, was bass drum, triangle, and snare drum is what we tackled. Um, then I said I would do the rest myself off screen so that we could save some time and not spend several weeks uh, watching the same process. But this is what I ended up coming up with. I have some bass drum, accenting, and climaxes. We got the cymbals, triangles, vibraphone, snare drum. Everything is pretty reliable and realistic. The only thing that ca might cause a little bit of issues is, if you'll notice, see, I did have this. I talked about how there are typically five... Um, Instruments, five drums for timpani, and this is their range for each drum. And when you write for timpani, each drum needs its own note. You, need to, you try to want to stick to one note per drum. So on here, we have the drum that would normally play E2 is going to have to be retuned very quickly in the space of a measure to hit B2 because one drum can't really do chromatic changes from like an A to B right away. So I've got notes that I took on that, but so that's the only really thing that might be a little suspect, but being able to change the tuning of a timpani over the course of two measures is pretty, most timpanists can do that. They specialize in playing timpani. That's their one instrument they do in the orchestra as a percussionist. So nothing to worry about there so much. And also the big thing, this is never going to be played. No, no real orchestra is ever going to play this, at least not to my knowledge. So it's okay. I can take some... A uh, couple of, uh, uh, I can take a couple leaps here and there. I don't need to focus entirely on what's playable. But other than that, I've got all the percussion I want. While we listen to this real quick, uh, I'll leave it focused on the percussion so you can see kind of which instruments are coming in and where. And then today, we're going to start getting stuff ready for the pre-mix. Uh, basically, like finding a physical space. We're going to create an actual space in the stereo image of our sound for each instrument to make sure that they, they sound like they're in a realistic acoustic space without reverb. We'll be doing reverb during the actual mixing process. But today what we'll be doing is we'll be applying track delays to various instrument families to kind of represent their position from backstage to front stage. We'll be using stereo imaging to find their location left or right. I'll show you my favorite plugin for that. And then, yeah, after that, if we've got time, I'm basically going to go through and we'll start setting things up for mixing where we'll be finding the final balance between each instrument. And to do that, I like to create new folders instead of folders that break across instruments, which I like to use when I'm writing music. Uh, I like to switch when I'm mixing to more of a melody accompaniment baseline type track folders. But yeah, so with that, I'm been talking quite a bit. As usual, any comments, any suggestions, any questions, feel free to throw them in the comments. I'll be responding while this video is going on. But real quick, let's listen to the sketch so far.
right, so there we go. That's our sketch, all right? That has gone through all kinds of changes, all kinds of shifts and reimaginations over the course of, like, what, these, like, 25, 26 videos? It's just crazy to think, spending over 24 hours on this uh and just the different forms it's taken but the next step is to start making everything sound like our final mix everything needs to sound more realistic and we'll go about how to balance everything how to make sure everything sounds works together my approach but the first thing we need to do is make sure that everything is actually ready for the mix and for that something i like to do is to create an actual physical space for each instrument let's put some notes and for this there are two, two specific kind of tools you can use. Stereo imaging and delay. All right, both of these are going to be used to create kind of a realistic orchestra. Actually, I should have prepped this ahead of time. Let me see. Orchestra seating chart. All right, I'm on my other screen here, but we'll pull up something real quick. All right, so we've got a clip art. Nope, that's not going to work. All right, but um, yeah, here's what we'll do. All right, so I have pulled up a quick example of an orchestra seating chart. And you'll notice that every instrument on this chart is going to have its own location. All right, so we've got the first violins to the left, cellos to the right, double basses up front, uh, also to the far right, piano, harp, percussion, all these different instruments have a very specific location. And whether you realize it or not, this is actually going to go a very long way in helping it create a more realistic sound, is if we can try and recreate these spaces. So there's kind of two fundamental approaches to this. First is to find out where are we going to locate each instrument uh, relative to being far left and far right. And then the second step is to find out how is everything going to be located in terms of being down upstage or downstage, all right? And so for the left and right, we can use panning or stereo imaging. For the front and backstage, we can use something called delay. Now let's focus first on the panning, all right? And then we'll come to everything else. But let's go to woodwinds. And for panning, we need to make sure everything is located where we need it to be located first. Let's go ahead and get rid of anything that's not being used. Not using that, 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 that. Oops, didn't click on that. Probably should have done this off screen. Sorry about that. Or like in a, outside the video. Remove that. Core techniques are not being used. Decorative techniques were not being used. Oh, ooh, bass clarinet. Wait, really? Bass clarinet's not used? Really? I didn't never once use bass. Oh, that's disappointing i almost always use uh bass clarinet let me double check yeah yeah there's nothing there wow bass clarinet's one of my favorite instruments right oh i can't believe i didn't use it anywho doesn't matter we don't need it so here we go these are our woodwind instruments all right so what we're going to do is i'm going to use a plugin Oop, that went off screen my favorite plugin it's going to be in spatial panner i like to use s1 imager stereo by waves audio all right so what this does is it's going to help us create an actual okay again off screen this is a picture of basically our orchestra pit our space now what i've done is i've actually gone through on previous projects and created my own presets based on where each instrument should be set so we're looking at flute one I did some research on an orchestra seating chart it's been a long time since i was part of an orchestra i used to play trumpet uh, still do, not nearly as proficiently as I used to. Uh, but yeah, so that's, uh, I am still a brass player through and through. Favorite instrument. There we go, preset browser. So I went through, found out all these presets if my computer can handle the load. But I've got, as you can see, some of them over here, trombone one. I've got everything figured out exactly where it needs to be. And when I eventually do a much more in-depth video on mixing, which will probably be part of the um expel like it will be part of the uh, orchestration series that i'm working on and it'll be in the new book and or class if you haven't voted on whether you want a book or a class yet check out my latest video uh but so here we have flute or clarinet one then for two three 
flutes and clarinets as a section. Since I like to write for each individual instrument, I'm going to apply the first chair flute here. And this is basically a little monotonous, but I'm, oh, did I just, oh yeah, that's right. All right, so here we go. I am basically gonna go through here and it's gonna take a little bit. Uh, and it keeps going up on the other screen for some reason. Um, we'll go to preset browser. And yeah, so this is gonna take a little while because we now need to basically go through and place the stereo imaging on each and every single instrument that I have based on their preset that I created. So this would be a really good point in time that if anyone has any questions, any comments, ideas, topics they would like to hear me rant and or talk about, uh, this would be a perfect timing to put them in the comments. I'd be more than happy to talk about anything and everything music related. Oops. Uh, let's see. So oboes, it looks like here for the oboes, I did not separate them into individual instruments. Uh, I'm not going to try and think of my reasoning behind that right now. All I know is I spent a great deal amount of time, so I decided that was the best approach to take. So instead of going with just like seat one or seat two, I'm going to go with the entire oboes and, and that's oboe three or English horn. Where are the double reeds? I've got a double reeded. Uh, where is it? Flutes, clarinets, double reeds. There we go. So there we go. We got that. Corian Glace. This one has to be a little more specific because the Corian Glace is played by a single player most of the time. They're not going to be an entire section of Corian Glace, which is the Corian Glace is just another word for English horn. So I need to create, I need to be very specific with this. And actually, is it down here? Is it easy to find? Oboe three. That's going to be the third player or second player. Whoever the last chair of your oboes is, is going to be typically the one expected to also double on English horn whenever needed. All right, so then we've got the clarinets again. And yeah, so this is, this can be a little bit of a monotonous time. I will say the very first time you do this, it's going to take quite a while because you've got to create all your own presets. It took me quite a while to make all my own presets, but it was worth it. Oh, uh, here we go. So something you may have noticed about some of these presets is, for example, I have clarinet and flute in the same group and double reeds instead of, oh, we need a the bassoon solo though. Let's see. I don't have a bassoon. I don't think I have a bassoon preset. I haven't made that yet. Well, I'd have to sit down and figure out the math and everything myself. And not that that would take too long, but I don't feel like I don't have a lot of space on my desk right now. So I'll just use the section panner for now. Um, but yeah, so the reason why I have things like flutes and clarinets in one preset, all the double reeds in one preset, is because they are seated together. The flutes are seated behind the clarinets. Let me make sure that's right. I'm pulling up my seating chart. Where'd it go? I was up for a second. There we go. So we've got the flutes and piccolos are in front of the clarinets. My bad. But you'll see that they're in the same general space in terms of left or right. And that can be something very misleading. This panning only focuses on left or right. You can do something a bit about front and back um, in S1 imaging, but I find that it works a lot better for me if I can focus on using track delay for that. And we'll be getting into track delay in just a second. So where are the bassoons, the double reeds? Uh, double reeds right there. Yeah, so once we've got a physical space on here for each of our instruments, uh, we can start to actually start balancing everything. And that'll be like the third step that we do today is my first step for balancing everything is to focus with the melody first. Because the melody, nine times out of ten in my music, is going to be the most important material. I don't usually write a lot of stuff. That, I mean, if, if there is a melody, it's going to be the most important material. That's all you got to know about my music for the most part. So I like to start with the melody. If it's the most important, I want to make sure that's all balanced, that it sounds like a natural progression of strength and volume 
as the music progresses, then it all blends smoothly. And then once I've got all the volume levels uh, where I want them to be, all the balance where I want them to be uh, with the melody, then I can go through and it's a lot easier. It's a much simpler matter of finding all of the accompanimental material. I'll start with melody, then I will do the bass line as the second most important to me. And then after bass line, that's basically when I figure out everything else. Uh, let's see here. All right, everybody's being pretty quiet today. No questions, no comments, no suggestions or ideas you would like to hear me just kind of rant about. Let's see here. Ah, for anyone who was here last week and heard me talk about the new project, or really anyone who was seeing the latest video where I talked about my uh, latest project, it is sounding, or it's looking like a book tends to be the most popular option. Uh, so I'm thinking people are asking for a bit of a hybrid option though of instead of an online class specifically or a book specifically, I'm thinking tra probably doing a book, but including a lot of audio files and video files along with it on my website. So including like links and stuff in the book for people to follow and find the information that I did harp by accident. I am so glad I caught that horns, not harp. Now the horns, you'll notice that I'm, if you, if you were paying attention, you may have noticed I don't have a specific horn solo section for my horns and that's because the horns tend to have a wider less less kind of focused sound so they tend to have a wider imprint on your actual sound now the trumpets however have a very focused very powerful sound and so again i hate how it keeps opening up on the other side you'll notice that i do have specific trumpet one trumpet two these are very narrow fields of vision that i'm placing each of these in oh really only one trumpet, really. This is a very weird arrangement. That's, of course, I'm the one who made it. So <laughs> that's the problem with putting this together one hour at a time, sometimes taking several weeks in between. But trombone one, trombone two. I forget my reasoning behind different decisions I make. And then I find myself questioning myself. So that was one part about this entire process, this entire live streaming uh, process is trying to find, oops, not reverb, create my own, like uh, trying to just accept things as they are, not try to get stuck in the details. Uh, let's see here. Tuba, tuba is another one that's going to have a very wide presence. Where's my tuba? It's going to be down here. There it is. Notice how it has a much wider compared to, say, the trombone. The trombone's much more narrow because it has a lot more focused directional sound. The tuba, not so much, so it has a wider presence. Like I said, in a separate video, I'm going to eventually tackle the reasoning behind this, the presets I made and why I made them the way I made them, and how you can make your own presets or use your own panning. Because you don't, you honestly don't need a plugin to do this. I like the S1 stereo imager from Waves personally, but you can get away with just panning. All right, if you want to use panning yourself, you can go with that. Um, I like to use these, the plugin, because I find it works well as creating presets. Ah, here we go. I'm quiet, but I'm watching. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to make these. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lonely Sea Productions. I really appreciate it. All right, it's, I really do enjoy just hearing the different stories and getting comments and feedback from everybody. Um, I don't, oh, it's getting better now, but I grew up in a very musical family, but I don't have a lot of people in my community who are as focused or as passionate about music as I am. And so I don't really have a lot of people to talk about music with. So that's one of the biggest perks of having this community here is just being able to have other people who are nerding out about music and are willing to watch my videos or talk about their goals or talk about different things that they're doing. I love, love hearing about different projects you guys are working on. Myself, I ended up staying up much later than I would like. There's a play I got commissioned to write for, uh, just three pieces of diegetic music, like a film, no, not songs, just music. And diegetic means that it's present in the film, or in the story, so the characters are aware of it. I had to write three pieces that would be, two of them played by a character, and one of them just kind of like ambient for a dream sequence, 
And it's been an incredible experience. I've never worked on a play like that because I am on a com I'm in a completely different state than New York, not even a bordering state, very far away from New York. I'm in Michigan, actually. Uh, and so not being on stage, not or on hand, not being able to see the rehearsals or see the blocking was a big challenge. I had to try and find all the timings myself. And last night, I thought I was done. I had talked about being done, I think, in my last video. But last night, last evening, yesterday evening, I got a text from the writer saying that the, who had written the play, saying that the director had changed some blocking and that they had actually edited one of my pieces by having it repeat a section. And they said that they had told them they're not they're not going to okay that unless they have my permission. And I was like, that's all right. Just give me some feedback. What are you looking for? And I will take care of it. Um, and wait, why do I have three violas? You know what? I've only ever got two going at the same time, so it doesn't matter. Um, no, that's violas. There we go. Um, where was I? Lost my train of thought. Well, yeah. So, yeah, they needed some... They need me to add another minute to the music. And it was all right. It was the easiest piece to adjust. It was an ambient piece. But it got a little tricky because there was a melody. And the director had cut it in the middle of a phrase. So the original, if I were to keep the timing they were looking for, I couldn't keep the same melody. It just wasn't going to work. Uh, if I was a little looser with the timing they had been looking for, make sure I got it, yeah, uh, then I could make the original melody work. I just had to adjust the melody a little bit. Um, I ended up making two different versions, one that stuck to the original timing, one that stuck to the original melody, and it kept me up a little late. It was fun. I've really loved being part of this project. Um, and I did end up getting a good mix, a good new arrangement. The play goes on tomorrow, though, so I was a little worried about like how last minute, but they're all professionals. The actor and actress, it's a small cast, like three people. They're, they're incredibly, incredibly gifted. I've seen small little snippets. I can't wait. I Unfortunately, I can't afford to go see it, I, which is a bummer. Uh, just because I can't afford the, uh, afford the plane tickets at the moment. So the music will be premiered tomorrow and I won't get to see it. And that's sad. But I am super, super, super excited uh, to get a video recording sent my way from the uh from a dear friend of mine who's the writer and they will be sending it to me so and this is me i've just been ranting at this point so again if anyone has any comments any suggestions any questions i'm just going to be sitting here chatting talking about myself one of my favorite topics to talk about <laughs> i'm kidding of course kind of sort of not really um contrabases there we go I did basses. Yeah, I did basses twice. All right, so I've got two tracks here. I must have done that when I was... Every once in a while when you've got a phrase and you're starting section by section to do the... You'll see, like, something I did here. There is a pretty big cut from the... Uh, what is it? The modulation and expression data up here. It's all the way up here, then it gets cut down really quick down there. That can be doing such an immediate... Shift can be very difficult if you're trying to keep on one track. So sometimes when I need a dramatic shift in volume or uh, modulation and I want to use my faders, I want to use my modulation wheel because for me, that's just how I get the most natural sound. I'll make a second track like this. I'll copy it. I'll just right click, duplicate tracks. I'll cut out the piece I don't want. So I cut out all that and I just start again here. Then typically I'll just move this up. I'll just merge the two by just using my merge tool. But it looks like I forgot to do that. I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to mess anything up. We'll come back to that later. So that was strings. Now the last one we've got is percussion. Timpani has its own specific one, I believe, that I made. All right. Uh, let's see here. So spatial planner. Let's see. we got timpani. Tuba, violas. Timpani. There we go. And then, other than that, each of these, I just have, like, non-specific generic percussion spots. Uh, because I... Oops, wrong plugin. Need to delete that. Need to 
delete that. There we go. Why? Stop it. There we go. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, talking about the percussion. I I never really know exactly what percussion instruments I want to work with. So I've just got some generic. I got like twelve or so slots for percussion that I did. And dang it, I keep doing that by accident. Let's see here. Oh uh, yeah, I'm kind of running out of things to talk about, guys. Anyone got any comments, questions? That's a lie. I've got plenty of stuff I can talk about. But I like talking with you guys when I can. Let's see here. Not trying to sound desperate or anything. Sorry. Uh, snare drum was next. We're almost done here. We're almost done with the stereo imaging. And then it's a quick matter of getting the delay figured out. So then we did percussion one. Let's do percussion three. I'm trying to create a little unique space for each of these. I'm trying to make sure that I've got them balanced uh, for like number of instruments on each side. I don't like having the percussion too heavily focused on one side. Let's see, percussion. So we did percussion one, percussion three, percussion 12, percussion 10. That's kind of overlapping a little bit with the timpanis spot. It's all right. And then we'll just do one more. Last one is the vibrant. Nope, marimba. I almost forgot about the marimba. I love the marimba. I grew uh well i didn't grow up it wasn't until later in her life but through like the late years of high school early years of college my abuelita would love watching the live streams of just marimba players in mexico and so i've got lots of fond memories of watching those incredibly gifted musicians um playing wonderful lively music um so it's always i love using the marimba. good uh, good memories of being with her um, so that's why I like to s sneak in the marimba whenever I can. Let's see here. Percussion, last one. I don't think I used four. Let's just pop that in there. All right, so now we have got a specific location left to right for each instrument in the orchestration. Let's give it a quick listen. To if you've got headphones on, it'll be a lot easier to notice. Uh, but you'll just see how... I wish there was... I'm sure I have a plug-in or something that could visualize it, but let's just give it a quick listen. We won't listen to the whole thing yet, just yet. stop there because i want to point something out all right so we have the bass drum and cymbal on very different sides of the stereo imaging so if we'll listen to that part one more time if you'll notice you'll have i believe bass drum in your left cymbal in your right Yep, and so this is just super important for creating a realistic mock-up or a realistic mix, is finding a specific location in the mix for each instrument. It looks like we got a couple questions. Will you consider making those presets available? Of course, yeah, I'd be more than happy to make these available. Um, I'd probably need a reminder, but I'll probably, these, I'll probably make them available when I do a more in-depth mixing process. Because I also, I don't want to just give them away because then people don't really learn so i want to when i do give them away i want to make sure that i have an explanation of why i made these presets because one thing to work with presets and understand why they were made the way they were and why they work that way because then you can adjust them if i just throw presets out though i find that lots of people it's very quickly if you don't understand why things were made to function the way they do you can very quickly misuse them. So I would like, so I will make these available. So thank you for the suggestion, Lonely Sea Productions. I will do that, but I'll probably wait until I have a chance to explain a little more in depth about stereo imaging and how I came up with those presets because not everyone is going to use S1 imaging. Um, but let's see here. Next one, back to the woodwinds. Here we need the inspector window open bit. All right, so what we are going to do where the volume all right so we have got what is this where is it let's see here quick controls i am looking for 
Let's see here. Insert sense, direct routing, favorite. That's what I thought. Oh, I see what's wrong. This is not an instrument. This is a bus. All right. There we go. All right. So the next thing we're going to work on is creating a delay. Oh, one second. There are some other comments. As far as pre-delay, do you go by distance from the brick wall or from the conductor? Good question. I'm actually going to get into that in just a second. I typically go from distance from the conductor. All right. No specific reason. That's just how I was taught. All right. And with delay, it's such a subtle effect. I imagine there are more experienced people than me who would die on a hill about which option to go with. But for me, I was taught to use it from the point of view of the conductor. That's the approach I use, and it works pretty well. And I'll be explaining about delay in just a second. I got a couple more questions. Totally get it. Thank you for your consideration. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lonely C. Uh, Separate Aud 1490. Can this be done in FL Studio? I'm a complete amateur and never considered this. I thought it was included in the audio library when the samples were recorded. Uh, yes, some of these, some audio libraries do use the panning. As far as if it can be used in FL Studio, I'm, I think so. I mean, I don't see any reason why it can't be. I... FL Studio is like the only DAW that I don't have a lot of experience with or like any experience with. I've never used FL Studio. So I don't want to speak out of turn. But as long as FL Studio can use the S1 Imager Stereo plugin, which again, that's the one I do. You can use it at wavesaudio.com. You can buy it. Careful, they will send you like 13 emails a day. I had to block them. It was tragic. But uh, just creates a very... Uh, one second. I made a mistake. What did I do here? Is this from the Piccolo? Wait, how did I not have something set up for Piccolo already? All right, well, I missed one. Piccolo is going to be flute or clarinet three. It's going to be the last chair of Woodwinds is always the one that doubles on another instrument. So there we go. We've got that taken care of. So yeah, it should work in FL Studio. Lots of studio libraries will focus on that. So for example, I am using my favorite library, which is Spitfire Studio orchestra all right professional i actually haven't met a lot of people who like this library as much as i do for me i love it because it's a very dry sound and i love to have control over my own reverbs and we'll talk about reverb in the next video when we start doing more about actual mixing but this library takes care of that already it already they record it with the instruments in their original position but depending on what kind of mics you decide to use for the library depending on stuff it has a different effect so for me and for a lot of people taking care of it yourself isn't gonna harm the mix it'll kind of sweeten it and make it a little bit uh a little more controlled all right so yeah this is not something you have to do it's something that you should do if you want to create the most realistic mock-up but for the most part again lots of this stuff is super super subtle especially with delay which is our next topic so Going back to our orchestra seating chart, you'll notice not all instruments are in the same line. We have violins up here, percussion way back here. And you gotta think sound is relatively slow, a lot slower than you would expect uh, compared to like light. Um, the general rule is sound moves about one foot per millisecond. I'm sorry for all of my uh, non-American friends out there who use the metric system. I don't know what the conversion rate would be, but one foot per millisecond. It'll be pretty simple to just keep in mind. In just a second, I'll give you the key. Uh, so if it moves one foot per millisecond and you assume that your instruments are about 25 to 30 feet deep from the point of conductor, you're going to want to make sure that you account for that. Because when you're listening to live orchestral music, it's a very subtle effect, but the sound hits you at a different Point. The percussion will hit you um, so like a violin playing at the same time and a snare drum playing at the same exact time are going to hit you at different rates. The violin is right next to the conductor. Less than a foot away, boom, it's going to hit them within that first millisecond. Percussion, the snare drum is 30 feet away. It's going to take 30 milliseconds. Again, this is a very, very subtle impact. All right. But it is very useful if you are really, really trying to make the most realistic mock-up possible so for this i'm going to give you some nice starting points all right and this is where the millisecond in the feet per millisecond becomes really helpful all right so let's say we're going to start we'll start with like a 25 foot stage all right so percussion equals 25 feet which is 25 milliseconds all right 
So we want a 25 millisecond break, all right? The wind instruments, so brass and woodwinds are typically seated behind the stringed instruments. So we'll cut that in about, I don't know, we'll take like 10 off. We'll say they're about 15 feet away um, from the conductor. So that's 15 milliseconds. And then the strings are right on top of the conductor. All right, so we'll say they're like zero feet away from the conductor, so zero milliseconds. So the strings don't need any delay added. The winds do, the percussion do, because all these instruments are watching the conductor for their timings. So when the conductor does the downbeat, they all play on that downbeat, so all the sound comes forward. Now the one exception to this is in ridiculously rhythmic pieces where People, there's less focus on the conductor, more focus on the percussion. So they're not focusing on when the conductor is telling them to play notes uh, according to the beat. They're listening to the percussionists and taking their cues from that. In which case, the sound hits the wind players, and the wind players are using that sound to play their notes. And then the sound hits the strings, and they are using that to go there. So this is going to be a little difficult to explain without visuals. So just know, if you're doing a supremely rhythmic, a very rhythm heavy piece where you would want the percussionists to be kind of like the main focus of the music, you can cut all these numbers in half. Go to about like 15 milliseconds for percussion, seven milliseconds for the wind, and of course, zero divided by two is still going to, I don't think you can divide by zero, can you? I don't know, I'm not good at math. By the way, it's still zero, all right? So we are basically going to go through each of these instruments and assign this level of delay. Now, there is some argument. Some people will say like 35 milliseconds for the percussion. Some people will say 30. Um, it depends on your preference. Personally, I have found the 25, 15, 0 just, it works really well for me. All right. Again, I do not have a master's degree in mixing and mastering. Uh, I'm sure some people would have a lot more specific Results are like, well, if it's this hall, you got to have this kind of distance, whatever. But, I mean, we're talking about milliseconds here, all right? 25 milliseconds is ridiculously short. It's ridiculously subtle, but it's still going to have a nice, strong impact about making things sound realistic. Ah, it looks like we've gotten, uh, yeah, oh, oh, thank you, about 30 centimeters per millisecond. Thank you, Ashford. Uh, I will also use Spitfire Audio Library. That's probably why it sounded proper. There's also an option for distance and fire. Yes, yes, there is. So that's getting into mixing, all right? So that's getting into, like, the microphone mixes that you want to work with. And there's different... That's a whole nother topic we're not going to get into, into in this video. In fact, unfortunately, that's an area I would love to learn more about specifically. So these are more generalized approaches to making MIDI mockups is finding the stereo imaging location left and right and the delay location. Um, the distance in Spitfire's libraries, I'll pull that up real quick. Right here, I'm not going to mess with it because I don't want to, of course, mess with it. This is the way it is right now. What this will do is automatically manipulate the microphones you're using. So this is my piccolo flute. We have, in the professional library, we have six different microphones we can choose from. We have the close mic, which is a microphone right up by the piccolo. We have the tree mic, which is kind of above and like listening to the section. We've got the ambient mic, which is a kind of above the whole hall kind of thing. Um, there's all kinds of different advantages to each of these mics. You'd have to read the manual to figure out and like play around with what you want yourself. This can very quickly become no, it's really, really, really getting into the nitty gritty. And if you don't know what you're doing, it can very quickly tear apart the realism of your mix. There is no reason why a flute and its mid register should be able to be heard powerfully over a 16, uh, 16 piece first violin section. All right. It just doesn't happen unless you have microphones. All right, and so if you don't know specifically what you're going for, the microphone, messing with the mics can come up with some zany things. But if you're not worried about realism, go for it. I'm not going to say don't try something. But these are more about general approaches, general approaches to MIDI mockups and to create the physical space, the stereo imaging, and the delay are time-honored uh, tools that can work with any library for the most part. Some of them can be a little weird um, and can help create a more physical and realistic space for each instrument. So let's go through... Each of our wind instruments, woodwinds and brass, and we're going to give them a 15 millisecond delay. 
All right. Ah, let's see here. A couple more. Do you use different reverbs for long and short articulations? For long and short articulations, I, I do not. I use different reverbs based on the location of the instruments in the pit, and we'll get into that during the mixing. But I find you can very quickly get lost in all the different strategies available for reverb. Uh, as long as you've got a nice solid one, I'll talk about the plugin I like to use for reverb, about the specific setup I have. My reverbs are designed to mimic the Boston Symphony Orchestra hall. I use the Valhalla Room reverb plugin. I've got some very specific settings in there that I love to use. The Boston Symphony Orchestra was like the first big time orchestra hall that I ever went to. I have some interesting memories about that concert, actually. Um, I went with my sister. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, but I loved the sound of that hall. And so fortunately, Valhalla Rooms had an article about customizing their reverbs and actually had specific instructions how to mimic that specific hall. So, of course, that's the one I like to work with. Let's see. No wonder you can't afford a plane ticket now, given how much these libraries cost. Yes, yes. These libraries, <sighs> these libraries set me behind quite a while. Fortunately, I have not gone crazy. I don't have that many libraries which is a lie. I have a lot of libraries, but I haven't purchased any in quite a while. I'm a big believer that once you find a library that works well for you, it's better to really master and learn that library than the others. But no, yeah, these are some expensive libraries. I got this one when I first started studying with Berkeley. I started out with the non-professional, loved the sound, loved the customizability of working with a studio sound versus a symphonic sound. And yeah, eventually upgraded to the professional version. I think it was like a Black Friday sale. So it was ridiculously marked down, but it was still super expensive. But I am rambling. We are quickly coming up on our allotted time. All right, so the delay right here, track delay in milliseconds is in the inspector. It's the third option here. If you can't see it, you can go down here and do setup. And I think MIDI modifiers is one of them. Well, you can go to setup and you can basically find it in here. Uh, I believe it's under quick controls. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I made this visible, but it should be visible. And let's just go quickly through this. All right, so it's a woodwind. We're going to do 15 millisecond delay. So basically, when a MIDI note hits in Cubase, it is going to wait 15 milliseconds before it actually triggers the sound. All right, we're going to do this for every single wind instrument, brass and woodwinds. This is how we get our delay. This is how we get our physical spacing regarding to up, being up or down stage. All right, so we did imaging stereo, uh, stereo imaging to get our physical space left to right. And here we are getting our physical location forward and back. One second, there we go. And that's how we get our physical location between their location left and right and forward and back most instruments should be given a very specific location in the mix let's get this a bit bigger that's the bus that all of these are being sent to and actually in the like what like more than 26 weeks like half a year maybe coming up on a year here that i've been doing this um i have changed my approach to reverb I've learned more, I've gotten better at it, and so I will be changing those buses eventually. Now the brass are all wind instruments as well, so I'm starting with my trusty 15 milliseconds. Again, it depends on how big you want your stage to be. Uh, I find 25, 15, and zero is my default go-to. So now woodwinds and brass have their place. Remember, strings are right by the conductor, so you don't need to give them any delay but the percussion are all the way in the back. So we're going to give them a larger delay, 25 milliseconds. So each and every one of these percussion instruments is going to have a 25 millisecond delay, meaning that the moment that the MIDI hits in Cubase, in our MIDI map here, all right, the moment right here where E2 says play this, they will wait 25 milliseconds before they actually trigger the actual sound. That's what this is doing. So triangle, vibraphone, and there we go. All right, so now we have our physical location. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to do a couple of examples here because this is another one of those time-consuming things that once I show how I do it, 
I'll do the rest of myself off screen to keep us from having to spend three or four episodes doing this. Uh, let's see here. No one is, they can't stay, but thanks for all the tutorials. It helps so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. I am so glad that you're able to stay, stay, uh, stop by. It's, uh, I'm really glad that so many of you guys find this helpful. Ooh, almost forgot. Do we have any piano playing? Piano. Ah, yes. A little bit. I must have copied and pasted that from the harp. Uh, this is going to be at the back with the percussion. For this arrangement, the piano can be moved around depending on where you want it spaced. Since it's not being featured at all, I'm just going to put it in the back with the percussion. So we'll put a delay on that as well. But yes, as I was saying, things. I'm not sure if you're still on or not. But thank you. I'm glad. I really, really am grateful for just kind of the community we're building on this channel. I really appreciate it. It's, you guys give me the opportunity to do what I love to do. I love music and I love sharing my knowledge about music. I love sharing my music. I love sharing lessons and everything I know about music. So this is, yeah. So thank you. Thank all of you. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Let's, we don't need the sketch visible anymore. We've got the markers. I did fix the markers while I was doing this. So what was I going to do? Oh, yes. All right. So next, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create three new folders. First one is melody. Second one is going to be accompaniment. I don't know if I spelled that right or not. My intelligence is highly selective on various skill sets. Spelling and mental math are not my two strong suits. Uh, melody, accompaniment, and the last one, bass line. So the two most important are melody and bass line to my own personal approach to finding the right balances. Um, then I kind of just fit everything else into accompaniment. Here's what we are going to do. Let's start. Let's listen to our first section. Actually, I don't think the melody comes in until section A1. So we're going to listen to section A1. Remind ourselves of where the melody is, which I believe is just in solo horn but let's double check all right awesome so that's the melody there and it looks like i believe it's playing melody over here as well yep that's definitely melody Yep, this is the melody to section B. So basically, this solo horn right here, all it's doing is playing melody. So I don't need to do anything to change it. I don't need to duplicate it. All I need to do is move it from the brass folder into the melody folder. All right? Let's listen to section A2 and figure out where the melody is in there. Sounds like it's in the strings. All right, so it's definitely in violins one and violin two. So what I'm going to do, this is an excellent example, right? I have got violin one, all right? And it is playing both accompaniment and melody at different points. So basically, I'm going to switch this into, I've doubled it. Let's start here. Let's find out. I'm going to try and isolate the melody and only the melody on this top track and then only accompaniment on this second track. Let's listen here. So there's that could definitely use some EQ. Uh, you can hear the hissing sound from the bows. All right, so here, measure 25 seems to be when it switches from melody. Yep, right there. So we've got two separate notes. Let's cut it right here. Try to be as precise as possible. So what I'm going to do is if I want this top one to be just melody, and the bottom one to be just accompaniment. I'm going to get rid of the melody in the second one. Let's see how long this goes. 
Then in section B2. All right, so section B2 is where it comes back to the melody. All right, so that's all melody, so we're going to cut that there. Uh-oh. One second. Did that clip one of the notes? No, it's still there. Sometimes if a note starts just before a downbeat, when you cut it, it'll clip it and get rid of it. So let's see here. So this is melody. This is not. So again, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to separate this one track of violin ones. This is just violin one. That's the only section. I'm trying to split it into multiple tracks. One that will go into the melody folder. One that will go in the accompaniment folder. All right, so let's listen to this last two sections and see if it's all melody or if there's accompaniment. All right, so that's all melody. Let's see section A4. What do we got here? Yep, so this is all melody from there on out. So the violin ones are typically playing just all melody in this piece. But now we've got it separated. We've got one track of just melody, one track of just accompaniment. Let's take these out of the string folder and put that into the melody folder. And take this one out of the string folder and into the accompaniment folder. And this is basically what I'm going to do for the next hour or so, or however long it takes me to do this is I'm going to split each individual section of instruments. Or in the case of the woodwinds and brass, each individual instrument, since I do individuals in brass and woodwinds. So for example, here we have a great example in the flute. We have it in right here. All right, so what we've got here is it goes from that ostinato figure right into the melody. I'm gonna split this into, again, the accompaniment versus the melody. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is it is a lot easier to mix everything based on what role it is playing, what layer of the music it is in. It's easier to mix everything and get as the melody. I make sure, all right, this needs to be the focus of the music. I need to make sure that all the melody instruments sound balanced. All the melody instruments sound strong and realistic. Then once I have all the melody instruments mixed together, I'll be able to start focusing on the bass line, which in my opinion is the second most important layer in the music. And then after bass line, the different accompanimental parts. But what this also helps with is when I'm doing different automation, like you can see these waves and these lines, there are moments in the music where I have a part that needs to go very quiet. I have a violins that are playing, for example, like in a couple, like, ah, right here, actually, speak of the devil, violins. Notice, we're going to make this larger so we can see it, but notice how there is a dramatic difference here. This is, I did something like this when we were, when I was trying to make this sketch sound a little more realistic. I mentioned this earlier. I made two tracks. I cut it right here and I just like moved it down to another track and did the automation automatically. So this is one way it'll make it easier because an instrument can dramatically change dynamics right away. A fader is a lot harder to get to manage and make it kind of so pinpointed. Then a fader are those sliding things that you see mixers using. That's what I use to manage things like modulation, vibrato, expression. And so it's easier to focus on like a melodic idea and get this one chunk at a time with a proper automation that I want than to try and do one long track with a bunch of different ideas like this one. So again, this is all about for the sake of making things easier and making things easier to balance, easier to manage when you're mixing. I now have to go through each of these instruments, break them into multiple tracks, and sort them from melody, accompaniment, and bass line. Again, I'm not going to make you guys sit through all that. That would be very boring. Uh, so I think that's the end of the video. All right, I'll do all of this on my own off screen. So just a recap, what did we do today? We learned how to use stereo imaging to give every instrument a location on stage from left to right from the counter from the conductor's point of view. We used delay to give every instrument further space on stage from how far away from the conductor they are. So now we have very specific locations for each individual instrument in our mix. We'll listen to the whole thing one more time in just a second. Um, 
But with all of this taken care of, the next step, next thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on creating a balance and using reverb and possibly, possibly a little bit of EQ to get rid of some of this mud. If we were listening to the violins real quick one more time. And... Oh, one second. All right, so I can't solo up. Uh, but there's a little bit of like hissing noises for that picked up in the bows and stuff uh, when the instrumentals were being recorded. So I might use some EQ to get rid of that. I try to be careful with EQ. You have to be so careful with it because uh, it can really destroy your mix if you don't know what you're doing. But uh, yeah, so we found our physical location. We did everything necessary for the pre-mixing. Next week, we will do more about reverb. Reverb and... We probably don't need compression for this. That's not going to be going in a film at all. So yeah, basically, next week, reverb and mixing and balancing and all of that great, great stuff. Um, so yeah, well, let's listen to it one more time. Um, if anyone has any questions, any comments, any suggestions, I will stay on for as long as I have material to work with and people to answer. So uh, yeah, as we listen to it, go ahead, throw your stuff in the comments. Looks like I got a couple. Um, things, my pleasure, things. I'm really glad that you're finding the tutorials helpful. I, it always makes me smile when I get people who are excited about it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, thanks again for everything. I have a great week. Have a great week. Thank you, Lonely Sea Productions. You as well have a wonderful, fantastic, restful weekend. Let's listen to this one last time together. I'll pull up the percussion so we can look at that. And yeah, as usual, if you have any questions, now is your last chance. Pop them in the comments and I'll answer them before we go. So there we go. Looks like I did not get any more questions during the repeat. So what probably won't be staying on much longer. But yeah, so thank you so very much to everybody who stopped by. Uh, next week, again, we'll be focusing on applying reverb to make it sound more realistic. Because um, these are all very, very, very dry samples. That's their selling point. That's why I got them. Um, so we'll apply reverb and we will focus on the oh-so-important balance to make sure that every instrument sounds for lack of a better word, good. All right, so with that, I hope all of you have an absolutely wonderful weekend. If you hadn't gotten a chance yet, check out my latest video. Give me some feedback on what you'd like to see for that next project. I've gotten some great feedback so much so far, so I'm really excited. I'll be making an announcement on that probably Monday about what my decision is. But thank you again to all of my patrons, once again, who make videos like this one possible. Thank you to all of you who share your wonderful support and comments with me. It really does make my day every time I get a nice complimentary 
honest, excited comment from somebody. So thank you, everybody. Until next time, keep studying, keep working hard, and as you know, keep writing new music. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.